Eisleben. The life of Martin Luther began and ended in this town in what is today central Germany. It was a life that was to change the world dramatically, more dramatically than any other event in the Christian church and European politics for centuries. And it is safe to say that never before had changes of such historical import been so closely bound up with a single individual as the Reformation was with Martin Luther. In those days, the town of Eisleben was in the district of Mansfeld in what was then Saxony. It had enjoyed a growing prosperity from copper shale mining since the 13th century. Throughout his life, Luther identified himself with Eisleben, returning to his hometown again and again. Hans and Margarita Luther had settled in Eisleben only a few weeks before the birth of their second son, Martin, on November 10, 1483. The next day, the future reformer was baptized in the Peter and Paul Church and named after the patron saint of November 11th, St. Martin. Sixty-two years later, by then famous across the continent, Martin Luther once again came back to Eisleben to mediate a dispute. He fell ill, and his life ended in the place where it had begun. Barely a year after Martin's birth, his family moved to the town of Mansfeld. His parents were simple people. His father, Hans, came from a farming family in Thuringia, but saw no future in staying on the land. A long-standing tradition gave the farm to the youngest son, but Hans Luther was the eldest, so he hired on as a miner. Copper mining was still developing in the region, and he was eventually able to lease a foundry from the Mansfeld counts. With much hard work and thrift, he built it into a thriving enterprise. Luther had what we would consider today a terrible father, and throughout his entire life he was never really able to get free of his father's influence, this oppressive, repressive, super-ego father. Even though later, once he'd gotten married, his father forgave him for entering the monastery, this influence from early childhood was something Luther projected on authority in general. If you take a close look at the way he interpreted the fourth commandment, you'll see how deeply authoritarian his orientation was, even though he himself was a very free individual. This father had great expectations for his son, Martin. He wanted him to make something of himself, to be someone, to get somewhere in life. So when Martin was just four and a half, his father sent him to school. Classes were held daily, with no weekends or holidays. On the curriculum were reading, writing, Latin, and singing. The principal method the teachers used to motivate their pupils was the rod. But they also invoked superstition, witches, and devils to instill fear and obedience in their charges. Later, Martin Luther was to describe his school as hell and the teachers as henchmen. At age 15, Martin was sent to Eisenach to attend Latin school, perhaps because many of his mother's relatives lived there. But Martin never stayed with his relatives, finding accommodation and warm hospitality with the well-to-do Schalbe and Cotta families instead.
Martin earned part of his daily bread himself by singing. At the time, it was customary for students to earn a little extra by serenading house to house, known as Kurendesingen. Martin Luther later remembered his years in Eisenach from 1497 to 1501 as being among the happiest of his life. He never praised any other town so effusively as my good city, my dear Eisenach. Martin was the best in his class and had such good command of Latin that he was able to compose verse in it. So far, the young Luther had lived up to his father's expectations, and now the elder Luther sent him on to Erfurt. The city, with its population of 20,000 at the time, was already 800 years old and one of Germany's major centers of commerce. Erfurt's university boasted an excellent reputation. The fashionable humanist philosophies were taught in its halls. Basic studies had to be completed in the seven liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, dialectics, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Only then could the student continue in one of three major programs, law, medicine, or theology. Martin Luther delved into the works of classical antiquity, Aristotle and Plato, but then, in the university library, he ran across a far more ancient book, one he'd never seen before. He found a copy of the Bible. At the time, all most people knew of the Holy Scripture was what they had been told. The version used by the clergy was in Latin, and only a few translations into Germany had even been attempted. The recently invented printing press was bringing more and more Bibles into circulation, but most students of scripture, even priests and monks, were familiar with excerpts, if anything. By 1502, Martin Luther had taken his first academic degree, a baccalaureate artium, and three years later, his second, a magista, placing second of 17 candidates. Martin's father hoped that his brilliant son would choose law, a field with good prospects for attaining prosperity and influence. But then, after Martin had been at the faculty of law for just one month, he went to visit his parents. And on the way back, he was overtaken by a summer storm near the tiny village of Stottenheim. Help me, help me, don't let me die like a dog on this road. Don't let me die! I'm a monk, I'll become a monk, I'll become a monk! I'll give myself to God, I'll give myself to God, I'll give myself to God, I'll give myself to you, I'll give myself to you, I'll give myself to you. Just spare me! Spare me! Just help me! He was scared to death, and in that state you'll promise anything. Luther was someone who was plagued by lots of anxieties, and he was hoping this promise would release him from this particular fear. But he was also hoping faith would release him from his fears in general, and only later did he realize the faith he actually encountered was the kind that only plunged him deeper into anxiety. That was probably a critical moment, when a lot that I am quite certain had been going through his mind before then came pouring out. So it may well have been the end point in a process of contemplation, that's the way I see it. That was the crucial experience for him. I'm sure it did not come out of a clear blue sky. A lot has to have taken place beforehand for a person to make such radical changes in his life just because of a natural phenomenon. He always thought of it as his crisis. What went on there? It seems that all of a sudden, the transcendental, the noumenal, the divine came into his life. What's fascinating about Luther is that from one day to the next, he confronted this divine something. He made his decision. Martin's friends pleaded with him not to bury himself alive. His father was furious and broke off all contact with his son. But Martin would not be deterred 
and on July 17, 1505, he knocked at the portal of the Augustinian Black Cloister in the Comturgasse in Erfurt, requesting admission. Luther gave up everything that had been of value to him and sold his books, keeping only his copies of Virgil and Plautus. He devoted himself to the rules of the order, immersing himself in the works of its founder, St. Augustine, and in Holy Scripture. Martin Luther often took on extra penance, fasting for days or praying through the night. His years as a novice was without reproach, so in September of 1506 he became a monk and took his vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience in the presence of his brothers of the order. Half a year later, on April 3, 1507, Martin was ordained a priest in the Erfurt Cathedral. In early May, when Luther celebrated his first Mass in the monastery church, his father put in a surprise appearance. He came with twenty knights and donated twenty guilders for the dinner. The Mass very nearly turned into a fiasco. Martin was trembling so hard he could barely hold on to the goblet. Nobis behuyus aque et vini. Mysterio. Aius divinitatis esse consortis. I tried to play Martin with doubt as much as knowing what's right, um, which I think that's a, a very a human um, condition, even with those who are driven 100%, uh, are pursued with doubt. And here's a man, he's a genius, invented a lot of the German language, um, and yet, and brought Rome down, and yet, yet um, I, I like the idea that he's still human and pursued by doubt, so if I was to draw any um, trait, it would probably be doubt. Luther found no relief from his burden of guilt, nor did he find answers to his theological questions in monastic life. His doubts and uncertainties grew. He could not reconcile the biblical concept of God's righteousness with the Greek conception of justice. Johann von Staupitz, the vicar general of the German Augustinians, became Luther's friend, patron, and spiritual teacher. I live in terror of judgment. This righteous judge who damns us. 
threatening us with the fires of hell. Jean, what is it you seek? A merciful God. A God whom I can love. A God who loves me. Then look to Christ. Bind yourself to Christ. And you will know God's love. Say to him, I'm yours. Save me. I am yours. Save me. Staupitz realized his young pupil was gifted. He encouraged Luther to continue his studies and teach at the newly founded university at Wittenberg. Luther was reluctant, thinking himself unqualified, but he obeyed. And then, Staupitz sent him on an errand to Rome. In the spring of 1511, Luther arrived back in Erfurt, thoroughly disillusioned with Rome and the worldliness of the clergy there. He concluded that the church was in need of reform, and he hoped to contribute to the process, but he had no thought of leaving the church. Have you ever read the New Testament, Martin? No, not that. Not many have, but in Wittenberg you will. Wittenberg. A doctorate in theology. You're sending me away to study. I'm sending you to the source, the scriptures, Christ himself. God gave you gifts for a purpose. In Wittenberg, you will be able to change minds, open eyes. And that's what you want, isn't it? To change things? Both were monks, both were quite earnest men when it came to their vocation. They were dedicated to their religion. One was very inquisitive, the other more objective, older, ironic, almost to the point of sarcasm. And this man loved and protected the younger man. That's the nature of their relationship. And I think it's something very beautiful especially with an actor like Joe, who is very open and lets me develop this aspect. That's something I liked very much about working on it. Staupitz sent Luther back to Wittenberg after a brief stay in Erfurt, this time for good. In those days, the little provincial seat was in what was then the electorate of Saxony, today's Sachsen-Anhalt. From that time on, Wittenberg was to be the center of Martin Luther's life and of the period's religious and intellectual debates. Who here has been to Rome? Did you buy an indulgence? No. I did. 
For a silver florin, I freed my grandfather from purgatory. For twice that, I could have sprung grandma and Uncle Marcus too, but when I didn't have the funds, so they had to stay in the hot place. As for myself, the priests assured me that by gazing at sacred relics, I could cut down my time in purgatory. Luckily for me, Rome had enough nails from the Holy Cross to shoe every horse in Saxony. <laughs> but there are relics elsewhere in Christendom. Eighteen out of twelve apostles are buried in Spain. <laughs> and yet here in Wittenberg, we have the pick of the crop. Bread from the Last Supper. Milk from the virgin's breast. A thorn that pierced Christ's brow on Calvary and 19,000 other bits of sacred bone. Just like old times, Martin. Excellency. Secretary. Prince's secretary. Prince Frederick is exceedingly proud of his relics. Then I'm sorry he didn't hear my lecture. Perhaps I could have swayed him. He spent 20 years and a large fortune building his collection. But in a week's time on All Saints Day, thousands of faithful Christians are coming to see. Paying to see. Do not bite the hand that feeds you, Martin. Our prince pays for your chair in this university. His relics pay for your chair. And he who pays the piper calls the tune. And so to play a character that, on the one hand side, obviously has to protect the, um, the interests of his master, also includes that he personally can't really honestly talk about what he personally thinks. But there is this twist in the script, and it reaches a point where they actually do speak personally, and you do get an insight in what he personally thinks of the situation. But it's all, he's always very careful about being too honest about certain things, because being a diplomat, he can't, because he has to find a diplomatic way of dealing with problems and solving problems, obviously. Master Cranach, is uh, Luther open to persuasion? <laughs> Not likely, my prince. He's as biddable as... Uh, as a donkey, you were going to say. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> Luther was too good a Catholic to remain a Catholic. In other words, he was so, he was so uh, critical of some of the habits of the clergy, especially ca taking money from people, superstitious people who thought they were getting an automatic transport into heaven because they made a financial contribution to the church. Uh, he suddenly was absolutely scandalized by this commercialization. Um, and uh, and it show, it's, it's a, a, a finger of warning to commercialization everywhere because he, was, he took action against it and started the Reformation. <laughs> In the town of Uteborg, just outside the territory of the electorate of Saxony, John Tetzel was drawing enormous crowds and doing a very lucrative business selling indulgences. He was a Dominican monk working under the patronage of the elector of Mainz. Good people of Uteborg, have you ever burned your hand in the fire? We to be spared the fires of damnation on the judgment day. Tonight, your Pope, the Vicar of Christ, sends you a gift. A gift to save you from such fires with this indulgence. When? Tonight. And only tonight. Seek the Lord while he is near. Here is your raft. Take hold. He seems to be perhaps the, the villain of the piece, but what I liked about him was that he was a man who was so, so convinced that he was right, so committed to his belief, and not, not doing it for any personal gain. He, he was going around the country raising money for St. Peter's Church in Rome. And he wasn't 
taking any of it for himself. He was living in a way, you know, he was absolutely committed to what he thought was right. As a preacher in Wittenberg, Luther was often confronted with the flourishing trade in indulgences, and he was annoyed by the indulgences his parishioners showed him. They had been led to believe that by purchasing these pieces of paper, they might cut short the time that they or their dead relatives spent in purgatory. While Luther preached on remorse, penance, and repentance, attaching a price only seemed to cheapen things. He sent a letter of protest to Albert, Archbishop and Elector of Mainz, but Albert had been the one who had commissioned Tetzel to sell the indulgences with papal authority under a secret agreement that half the proceeds go to pay off Albert's considerable debt to the House of Fugge. The other half went to Rome to help refinance the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica. I did this for Greta. Issued by the Archbishop of Mainz. Where did you get this? Jutebog. I bought it in the church. It's just paper, Anna. These words mean... It's no good. You must put your trust in God's love. Save your money to feed Greta. Hmm? It was about this time that Luther had what is known as his tower experience. Luther had been meditating on the real meaning of the justice of God when he remembered the passage, The just person lives by faith. This scripture appears to have opened the door to Luther's understanding, and he made what has since been called the reformational discovery. It was that man is not made just before God through his works, much less through the purchase of indulgences, but through faith alone. No one could have anticipated the explosive theological and political power this simple realization would have, and still has to the present day. Der Turm Luthers war ja Teil der Stadtmauer. Luther's tower was part of the city walls, and just a few years ago we excavated this tower, that is, its foundation walls. So now you can see the place where it all began, you might say the birthplace of the Reformation. But it would be difficult to define one particular moment as the beginning. It was a long process, a process of reading, of contemplation, and of suffering. Eine lange Entwicklung des Lesens, des Nachdenkens, des Leidens. Until he read this passage in Romans 1, 17 and made the breakthrough, which was, God loves me the way I am. You don't get there from one day to the next. It is a long path. Das ist ein langer Weg. But now we can physically locate that path. And the people who pass this site can say, this is where it began. This is where world history was rewritten. I can imagine that it was a process of liberation, of inner liberation. And once he had reached the end of it, he was so firmly convinced, he had found such a solid foundation, that he could stand up to the Pope and the Emperor in the Imperial Diet, and he'd lost his fear. Maybe it's just a myth. Maybe it had something to do with Luther suffering extremely severe digestive problems while he was here, as he had so often before. It's also possible that he had simply been playing with some ideas, as they say, until he realized that God is not someone who demands righteousness of you, who demands that you be a blameless human being. 
You could never be that anyway as a human being. Rather, God is someone who is good to you and then says, now you be good as well. It's not, I'll be good to you only if you're good to me, but rather, as Luther so wonderfully put it, God does not look upon you because you are beautiful. Rather, you are beautiful because God looks upon you. To Albert of Mainz, most illustrious prince, I make bold because it is my duty to serve you and to warn you of the crooked practices of those who claim to represent your grace. In a letter of protest to Albert from Brandenburg, Luther enclosed a copy of his 95 Theses, hoping they would explain his theological stance. But whether Luther actually nailed those theses to the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg is now a matter of debate. Well, the tour of the All Saints Church was in fact the bulletin board of the university. The All Saints Church was where all the important university functions were held. It was the university's festival and assembly hall. So it would not have been all that unusual to nail the theses up there, on the bulletin board, the main bulletin board of the university. It's not impossible. But no one can prove it historically. That's the way Melanchthon told it a few years after Luther's death. What is quite certain is that, at that time, Luther was a very restrained, cautious man. And before anything else, he expressed his anger over the indulgences through the official channels, you could say, by sending it to Archbishop Albert. Luther gehört zu den Persönlichkeiten, um den sich bestimmte Mythen ranken, die historisch Luther is the kind of figure who gives rise to certain legends that are false or historically dubious, yet true, or at least truthful in spirit. His theses may not ever have been nailed to the door or bulletin board of the All Saints Church, but they did spread all through Europe and they had their effect. One thing that's very important to me personally about the theses is that Luther, this doctor of divinity, demanded that people debate them for the sake of truth. He didn't just assume, as they would have in eternal Rome, with the Pope at the head, that the theses would simply be put into effect, but he nailed them up there for the sake of truth and in an effort to create a deeper understanding of them. At any rate, they were propagated from Wittenberg. And they did trigger such a debate that Luther would later find out that you don't fool around with the powerful. The powerful don't want any points made. They make their point with power and don't want the power of differing viewpoints. And he experienced that all the way to Worms. He put up resistance. Therein lies the greatness that, in a sense, ushered in the Enlightenment, which Luther himself tried to obscure later on. Den zu verdunkeln, Luther später auch sich durchaus beteiligt hatte. Fritz? What? Dr. Luther wanted everyone to see that. And everyone will. Without Johann Gutenberg's invention of the printing press, Luther's works and theses might never have had the effect they did, at least not in such a short time, and not with such force. The Reformation was, in a sense, a media revolution, and the media were pamphlets and books. And one immediate effect was a drastic reduction in the indulgence seller John Tetzel's revenues. One-fifth of the usual take. How will you explain this to Rome? Damn that heretic. He will burn in hell. Luther was summoned to a personal interview with the papal legate Cardinal Cajetan in Augsburg. Cajetan demanded that Luther recant unconditionally. If not, the cardinal had orders to arrest him. But the interview turned into a debate. Luther would not recant and fled Augsburg. Johann von Staupitz released him from his monastic vows so that as Luther's superior, he would not be obligated to send him to Rome in chains. You have one word to say and one word only. Revoco, 
I recant, and the matter is over. You have erred by teaching new doctrines. Which of my teachings is offensive to Rome? For one, indulgences. Pope Clement's decree, Unigintus, clearly states that the merits of Christ are a treasure of indulgences. Acquired. I'm sorry, Your Grace. I think you'll find it says the merits of Christ acquired a treasure of indulgences. I am not here to wrangle with you. No, Your Grace. But Unigantus was issued 175 years ago. And were this decree not so embarrassing to our church, perhaps it would not be commonly called extravagante. The Pope interprets scripture. He may interpret it. But he is not above it. He was to say one word. We both know that selling of indulgences have no scriptural support. <laughs> if common people could read the Bible for themselves, they would understand just how broad the church's interpretation is. The Turks are. are building armies on our eastern borders. We are on the brink of war. And just when we need unity most, you create confusion. My goal is not to quarrel with the Pope or the church, but to defend them with more than mere opinion. The gospel cannot be denied for the word of man. Martin Luther, in the name of Christ, I release you from your vows to the Augustinian order and commend Father, you to I God's mercy. Do this, I'm no longer your father. If you understand, where are your father? Then under canon law, I will be obligated to deliver you to the authorities. But I'll be your spiritual father. During the summer of 1520, Luther produced three of his most important and defiant works. A prelude concerning the Babylonian captivity of the church, of the freedom of a Christian man, and his address to the Christian nobility of the German nation. In them, Luther spelled out his attitude toward worldly and ecclesiastical authority and discussed the ethical implications of his idea of justification by faith. The church saw this as a direct attack. In Louvain, Liège, Mainz, and Cologne, they burned Luther's works. The Pope issued a bull exerge domine, threatening Luther with excommunication. Why was Prince Frederick not apprised of your letter to Albert of Mainz? Why? I did not want him compromised. Now our prince can swear before God he had no knowledge of my writings or my criticism of the archbishop. Criticism of the archbishop? What of your criticism of Rome? Do you have any idea how embarrassing this is to Prince Frederick? You have been summoned to appear by Rome. He's a very ambitious man. He's a very confident man. And I think that Aleander would like to have seen himself as the man who's going to reform the church. And it doesn't happen. Luther's the man who reforms the church. So I think there's a, there develops throughout the film a degree of personal jealousy for Luther. The fact that Luther can command this adoration and this love. And uh, Aleander doesn't really command anything. So I think there is, a sort of, uh, there is a personal antipathy towards Luther as well as an intellectual one. The cardinal demands that Luther be delivered to Rome or banished from Saxony. Have you read Luther's work? Yes, all of it. Yes, he's a brilliant little monk, isn't he? With an independent mind. Yes, he is. After all, all he has done is to debate eloquently on a most uh, interesting subject. And after all, that is all one can ask a good university professor to do. So what shall we say to the cardinal? Uh, nothing. Excommunication now seemed imminent. Luther answered by consigning the papal bull exerge domine to the flames, saying, Because you have corrupted God's truth, may God destroy you in this fire. Now it was the church's move. It's what Rome calls a papal bull, an edict from the Pope himself. There's only one thing to do with this blast of wind. Yes, feed the fire. Feed the fire with canon law. Feed the fire with every lie ever written in Rome. Come on, feed it. Feed the fire. Feed it. Feed the fire. Feed the fire. Feed the fire. Feed 
Luther placed high hopes on the young, newly elected Emperor Charles V. God has given us a young and noble sovereign, Luther flattered Charles in a letter he sent him along with a copy of his Address to the Christian Nobility of the German Nation concerning the reformation of the Christian estate. Frederick the Wise, Luther's patron and protector, met the emperor in the Cologne Cathedral in an attempt to save Luther from being put on trial in Rome. Deliver Luther to Rome. I cannot. He is my subject. It's my duty to see that he gets a fair hearing. Aliando has given me his word that the Inquisition will give Luther a proper hearing. <laughs> the Rome Inquisition does not give hearings, my lord. It gives death sentences. The heretic must be tried. Your blessed grandfather, Maximilian, told us that no German subject would ever be condemned without a fair trial in his own country. Then we shall hear him in Germany, in Worms. Worms is still a very long way from Wittenberg, my lord. And the Pope himself has put a bounty on Luther's head. His spies are everywhere. Then I will ensure Martin Luther's safe conduct to a fair hearing. I myself shall send you an imperial guard to escort him. On that, give my word. <coughs> With Frederick the Wise, Luther was incredibly lucky. Frederick was a fox. He really should have been called Frederick the Fox. He very wisely kept his distance from Luther, from Luther as a person, and did not ever meet with him, even though the two lived within walking distance of each other. But Frederick saw him in Worms, and he protected Luther. He knew what he had in Luther. It was of world-shaking importance that a Saxon elector sensed that here in this cultural desert, something would come of this monk. Something momentous for Europe, for the world. Charles V agreed to grant Luther a fair hearing at the imperial diet in Worms. Even so, the only outcome acceptable to the emperor and his advisors was for Luther to recant. Luther's appearance was not even at the top of the agenda for the Diet, which had to deal with problems far more pressing, such as the Turks at the gates of the Holy Roman Empire. Do you, Martin Luther, recognize these books? The 95 Theses. Are you the author? All are mine. These books contain heresies against our Holy Church. Do you recant what you've written? Luther was phenomenally productive. The tracts, books, treatises, letters, sermons, commentaries, and notes of his table talks fill 64 volumes in the great Weimar Complete Edition. Certainly not all of his writings were of equal quality or equal significance for the Reformation, but a reader cannot fail to be impressed by the rigor and consistency of his theological arguments, and even more by the sheer direct force of his language, a language that spoke to the theological scholars and the political establishment just as it did to the ordinary people. In his basic positions, therefore, there was nothing Luther felt he needed to recant at Worms. You wait in vain for a disputation over things that you are obligated to believe. Now give your answer. Yes or no. Since your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer. I cannot. And I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. There was, I think, uh, a great wish to explore the man and not let him just become, unless, and discover a human being um, failed, frail, uh, insecure, aggressive, thoroughly obnoxious at times, um, very human. And uh, it seemed that so much of, of what we were reading 
uh, and what was being expressed to us, particularly by numbers of theologians. Um, this, this was obscured and left out, and we, we were most anxious to find the human character there, the flawed one. Martin Luther, step down and your comrade will be spared. I am Luther. It was Georg Spalatin, the secretary of Frederick the Wise and former university friend of Luther's, who staged the kidnapping. Hans von Berlepsch, the governor of the Wartburg, helped carry it out, spiriting the reformer off to his mountaintop fortress, the kingdom of the birds, as Luther called it. After the imperial diet, Charles V issued the Edict of Worms, declaring Martin Luther an outlaw. Now, anyone could kill him with impunity. Luther, however, was safe in the Wartburg, but no longer free. After the years of stress and confrontation, a period of peace and tranquility was now forced on him. As time wore on, Luther began to feel isolated in the Wartburg. Frustration and doubt took hold and grew. It's quite possible that it was desperation over involuntary idleness that caused Luther to take on what was to become one of his greatest achievements. Within just a few months, he made a draft translation of the New Testament from Greek to German. In doing so, he created the basis for a standard written German language whose influence is felt in the nation's intellectual and cultural life even today. This is not the time, Martin. Well, the emperor's gonna burn me anyway. He'll burn us all. This is treason. To have a New Testament in German, in words ordinary people can understand. Yes. It's the thing Rome fears most. Well, you must blame the author for that. Prince Frederick kept Luther out of the public eye for his own protection. But life outside the Wartburg went on, and events were picking up speed. In Wittenberg there was unrest. Radical leaders appeared, making radical demands. Disguised as a knight named Georg, Luther risked his life and slipped out of his refuge. Shovels, run! Martin, when a limb is rotten, you must cut it off. You know that as well as I. Get out! Martin, this is for you! Let it burn! Get out of Wittenberg before I beat you out! Beat me out! I defended you! I supported you! I'm carrying on just as you would have! You think this is my work? This is never my work! No, it's the people's work! The people's work! Andreas Bodenstein, known to history as Karlstadt, had supervised Luther's doctoral thesis and given him support and encouragement. But now, as Luther saw it, Karlstadt took his own interpretation of scripture too far. Like him, Luther condemned the worship of images and statues, but Luther had never called for them to be destroyed.
Karstadt's rallying cry was picked up by Thomas Münzer. During this time, he was Luther's most dangerous adversary, an initial supporter turned renegade. Luther opposed unrest and violent resistance of any kind. He took to heart chapter 13, verse 1 of Romans, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. But Thomas Münzer would not settle for that. As he saw it, the people didn't owe any obedience to an unjust ruler. On the contrary, it was their duty to resist. He threatened revolution. Untold thousands of peasants, common people, and nobility were killed in the peasant revolts. And Luther felt their blood was partly on his own hands. rebels were outside God's law, that nothing on earth is more poisonous, hurtful, or devilish than a rebel, that they must be stopped by every means possible. And yet, the blood they shed is as nothing compared to this slaughter I have unleashed. Some say 50,000, some 100. 100,000 dead peasants. Luther war dagegen, dass man sein Recht mit Gewalt Luther was against violence as a means of achieving one's rights. He accepted only debate, scripture, the word of truth, courage, yes, but not violence by any means. But the peasants couldn't take it anymore. And they had spiritual leaders who urged them on, who saw the final battle coming, people like Thomas Munzer. And Luther heard reports of the pillaging and even murdering peasants and reminded the murderous powers that were of their duty to take action against them. He may very well have been misinformed, but in the end, his decision was for order and against chaos. Better tyranny than anarchy, or as Luther would put it, in each of us lurks a hundred tyrants, and it's better to suffer injustice from one tyrant than from several hundred tyrants. I think for many of his followers, that was a very bitter disappointment, and yet for him it was a retreat from the chaos that had been spreading. I think we might be able to see some parallels to the French Revolution here. He had no political program for these developments, and he certainly didn't act consistently either. Nor did he have any ideas for how this uprising and disobedience could be brought under control. The history books tell us that when Luther first heard that Thomas Munzer had died, he went off and spent a day behind closed doors. I think it must have been quite a shock for him, a development that he had never wanted. But Luther had all but appealed to the princes to put down the rebellion. So his was a very ambivalent, not especially consistent role. That much is obvious. Luther wird zum Ordnungspolitiker infolge des Bauernkriegs. Politically, as a consequence of the peasants' revolt, Luther supported the status quo. And he was not alone. His co-reformer Philip Melanchthon stood right by his side. And suddenly there were two movements. There was the so-called left-wing reformation, which stressed the revolutionary elements. And then there was the wing of what I'd really call the status quo supporters, who tried to preserve state order as it was. Man muss 
für Luther im Nachhinein Verständnis gewinnen. In hindsight, you can find some understanding for Luther's position. He was worried that the new teaching would be lost in all the political chaos. And he didn't see any other way but the necessity of consolidating authoritarian political structures so his teaching would survive. Otherwise, it would have been swept away in the general chaos. It's hardly surprising that in the East German view of history, Thomas Münzer was accorded greater importance than Luther himself. Taking the Gospels as his foundation, Münzer aspired to improve the condition of the common man in the here and now, even resorting to violence if need be. That was where there was friction with Luther's interpretation of Scripture, although Luther was not fundamentally opposed to social change, even revolutionary change. We are seeking Dr. Luther. Please, my sisters and I escaped three days ago from the convent at Limschen. You, you still came here? Because this is where Dr. Luther lives. Sir, we were smuggled out in these herring barrels. We've been two nights on an open wagon, have had no rest, nor food, nor sleep. So if you could just tell I... me... I... I'm Luther. Katerina von Bora. Until recently, posterity in neither East nor West fully appreciated Katharina von Bora's importance in Martin Luther's life and work. But he himself certainly did. Luther knew full well what he had in his Katie. Paul the Apostle may have preached that women should have no voice in the community, but in the Luther home, Katharina had far more than even just a voice. She was in charge of an extended household. She managed the finances, the brewery, the farming, and the livestock and she became an extraordinarily emancipated woman for her time. Doctor, I feel your heart when we make music together. But when the music ends, you flee. I'm a man of blood, Katie. I defy people. Thousands have died because of... Most days I'm so depressed I can't even get out of bed. People try to make me a fixed star. But I'm not. I'm a wandering planet. No one should look to me for guidance. Two things, I promise you. We will make joyous music together. And to get to you, your enemies will have to step across my dead body. In return, I ask only one thing. That you bring none of them to our marriage bed. Not peasants or princes or popes, unless he be a god of love. Originally, their marriage was, was not really a romantic um, our romantic idea of marriage. I don't think it began with them falling passionately in love. I think they decided to um, go on a journey together because they kind of recognized each other. And um, it was a profession, a vocation that they took on that actually eventually grew into love. And there's some really lovely letters where, you know, they, they had a wonderfully long, rich marriage. <laughs> If I were to tell you that Albert of Mainz sent us a wedding present, what would you say? Send it back. Then it's as well he did no such thing, or we'd be having our first quarrel. <laughs> Luther had the great luck that he emotionally fulfilled. Luther had the good fortune that it came to be a real love relationship. That was rare at the time. 
But he also did quite a bit to make it so. He wrote wonderful lines that reveal how sensitively he approached his marriage. At first, Katie was pretty much a stranger to him. But he writes so beautifully, for instance, All at once I wake up in the morning with a braid of hair next to me. What other man can remember the first time he was no longer alone, first thing in the morning? Or, Luther writes about having breakfast with her and they're trying to find things to talk about. These were two completely different worlds that suddenly came together. The way he grows into this marriage, the way he consciously describes it, that shows Luther was not just a hot-tempered hard head made of solid German oak. He was also an exceptionally sensitive observer of his own life. He no longer saw celibacy as a value, as an accomplishment that somehow made him better before God. In fact, Luther basically founded what we now call the Protestant Parsonage. And in doing so, he elevated the love between man and woman, or the family, to an entirely new status. He made it something positive and valuable. And the idea that God had given us our sexuality, for example, was, I believe, a kind of liberation. Many of his followers were very ambivalent about it and said, maybe he's not the great man of God we admired so much after all. But I think it was a gift that we as the Reformed churches can see very positively, that the pastors today, both men and women, are in close touch with life, with households and relationships. Luther not only had six children of his own, but another six children of his sisters in his house. And it's written that even in his old age, he enjoyed spending time with the children. So he was a real family-minded father, and an example that having a family and raising children was something valuable. Es war alles zusammen. It was everything together. It was real love, but had to grow first. She wouldn't let loose, she waited while he presented all those suitors, but she wasn't happy with anyone he recommended. She knew what she wanted, and just waited until he came around. Besides, they married shortly after that terrible peasants' revolt. That was an ominous sign, but to Luther it was also a signal that life goes on and we have to build our lives from the bottom up and live with one another according to God's commandments. Like sexuality, marriage is one of the good gifts of God. And bear in mind, Luther came from a tradition that said the devil was most likely to be found under the bed. He never quite got rid of that either. But it's true that he not only enjoyed life as a married man and sleeping with his wife, he interpreted it as well. Even before he married, Luther knew quite a lot about what happens in a marriage. You could also see the marriage as a kind of flight from the social turmoil. I think it's fantastic Luther found this woman. Otherwise, he would have gone to pieces completely, inside and out, on that old sack of straw he'd slept on for eight years. And without Katie, he probably would have starved as well, because he was always giving away everything he had. As Luther himself put it, it is good that God introduced the state of matrimony. Otherwise, the elders would not care for the children. The housekeeping would break down and go to ruin, whereupon the police and the worldly powers and even so religion would not be respected. And all things would fall to pieces and a wild wasteland would take hold of the world. The records of Luther's so-called table talks provide a unique perspective on his thoughts and feelings on theological, political, and many private topics as well. The Luthers had ample room for paying students in the many cells of the former Augustinian monastery that was their home, and Martin also always had many invited guests at his table. So the midday and evening meals were often lively, sometimes boisterous. They provided Luther with an ideal platform for expounding his ideas and commenting on the events of the day. Several versions of these table talks have been published, starting in 1531 during Luther's lifetime. Some of the former guests at his table even made good money from them, but Luther himself never saw a penny. The copyright laws of the time weren't quite what they are today, and at any rate, Luther's business sense was fairly lacking. 
A frequent guest at Luther's table was Philip Melanchthon. Once his opposition to Luther's marriage to Katharina von Bora and conspicuous absence from their wedding had been put aside. The only woman allowed in the room was Katie, though usually just to pour the wine. But we know that from time to time she also joined in. These talks ran the gamut. They included everyday things like who's together with whom and you know that he's with her and so on. Wittenberg was a small town, just as prone to gossip and idle talk in the 16th century as it is in the 21st. These talks also reached the lofty heights of theology. They were about the doctrine of justification and about politics. And now and then, the Luthers had guests who'd tell about the situation in Hungary, what the King of Denmark was up to, or how the wars against the Turks were going. That's the fascinating thing about these table talks. They are dialogues with Luther. Students kept the notes, writing down the whole setting of the conversations as well, and even the simple small talk. These are not stencilized, idealized, stilted formulations. It's as if you're listening in on the conversation. And it's authentic Luther, more authentic than you'll find in any other type of text. Luther's closest collaborator in the cause of the Reformation was Philip Melanchthon. He may have been slight of stature, but he had a towering intellect. And his calm, even temper was an ideal complement to the often explosive and aggressive Luther. The efforts of many other fellow travelers were also necessary to make the Reformation an established fact. Luther sent his trusted friend Nikolaus von Almsdorf to be the first superintendent of the new church in Magdeburg. Luther took special pride in the newly founded municipal school there, which had Kaspar Kusiger as its first rector and Martin Agricola as its cantor. Magdeburg swiftly grew into a stronghold of Protestantism. The Bible, the Gospel Truth Luther founded his own faith and work squarely on Holy Scripture, which he took to be God's Word revealed. But that didn't keep him from examining the Bible critically and valuing some parts of it more highly than others. Romans, for example, was more important to him than the Epistle of James. He was unable to reconcile James with his own doctrine of justification. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. To the end of his life, he was deeply concerned that his students, followers, and successors might interpret Scripture differently than he had laid it out in his teaching. Luther's confrontation with the Pope was in fact only the first of many battles. He fought others against the radical reformers he called fanatics, and against the Swiss pre-Calvinist Ulrich Zwingli. What is it? What has happened? The Empress summons our princes to Augsburg. Why? To finish what he began at Vahans. You mustn't go. They'll fry you like a suckling pig. If you die, everything you stand for dies with you. All right, all right. What will you say? How will you I make them change know. their minds? Don't know. Well, I need to know. I need to know. Katie, first they wanted me to recant. Now they want half of Europe to bow the knee. We must fight. Let somebody else fight. Let somebody else be roasted like a pig. <laughs> Under the Edict of Worms, Luther continued to be an outlaw and in danger for his life if he appeared in Augsburg. So he and his friends and associates met in the castle of Coburg, the southernmost town of Saxony at the time. From there, they hoped to influence the proceedings at the Diet of Augsburg, held in 1530. Philip Melanchthon was not able to speak at the Imperial Diet either, but he authored the Augsburg Confession, producing one of the central documents of the Reformation. Meanwhile, from a distance, Luther worried that as a mediator, Melanchthon could be too accommodating. Nonetheless, Luther gave his full approval to the Confessio Augustana, as it was presented by the Protestants. Charles V and the Catholic princes refused to accept it, however. Beloved princes of the empire, I will be brief and to the point. Your ministers shall not preach, and you will outlaw these Bibles in the common language and declare anyone who possesses one an enemy of the state. Before I let anyone take from me the word of God and ask me to deny my belief, I will kneel and let him strike off my head.
Your Highness, we have drawn up a confession of our faith, which I believe you will find blameless. Immediately following the Imperial Diet, a number of Protestant princes joined to form a military alliance called the Schmalkaldic League. A commentary by Luther, justifying resistance to the emperor in matters of faith, provided the theological basis. At the request of his prince, the Saxon elector John Frederick, Luther set out the tenets of Protestant teaching in the Schmalkald Articles. About them, Luther said, these are the articles on which I must stand, and, God willing, shall stand, even to my death. He was no champion of the ecumenical idea ahead of his time. He was an actual champion of the ecumenical idea, of the unity of Christendom on the basis of Holy Scripture. If it's at all possible to achieve unity on it, he didn't want the schism of the church, he wanted the reform of the church. Ecclesia semper reformanda. The church is only a church if it is always reforming itself. That was his credo. That goes for the Protestant church and it goes for the Catholic church. If Luther had lived at the time of Pope John XXIII, it's not very likely the church ever would have split with all the terrible consequences that Erasmus von Rotterdam had predicted, the Thirty Years' War and all the ruin that came with it. We Christians do the world the greatest service we can by seeking and stressing what unites us, and especially by putting an end to the squabbling at the table of the Lord. What Christians are doing here reeks to heaven. It's against the spirit of Christ for the table of reconciliation to continue as a symbol of division. And Rome has to answer for it before God up to the present day. I very definitely see Luther as a champion of the ecumenical idea. Because after all, he didn't want to found a new church, he wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church. And in the meantime, his basic proposals have been accepted by the Catholic Church. This fact was even celebrated in Augsburg in 1999. I see Luther's insight on the common priesthood of all the faithful as a basis, for instance, for the ordination of women. At the time, he probably hadn't even thought of it that way. But what he was saying was, everyone can be a priest, man or woman. No one can elevate himself above another because of a consecrated status. And that's the subject of a heated debate in the ecumenical movement. Many Catholics, for instance, see it the same way, even if it's not their official doctrine. One of Luther's principal collaborators, Melanchthon, helped prepare the way for the ecumenical idea, trying over and over again to build bridges between the two theological systems. One thing he experienced as especially bitter was that, after Luther's death, his successors often took a much tougher, more hard-nosed and also a more simple-minded position than Luther himself. So, in a sense, it isn't Luther, but his successors who should be made responsible for this schism. In his later years, Martin Luther bitterly attacked the Jews because they hadn't accepted the gospel he had reinterpreted and offered anew. Years before, he had struck an altogether different tone. From his pamphlet of 1523, that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, Europe's Jews could easily have gotten the impression that new and better times were in the offing for them. But in his later writings, Luther gave rhetorical vent to his disappointment over the failure of the Jews to respond to his new gospel. These vitriolic tirades against the Jews were not racist, but rather theological in nature. And Luther directed his vitriol not only against Jews, but against the peasants, the Pope, the Turks, and the Koran as well. Let every other one be as he is, 
and then you can be as you are. The idea is for us to stop constantly trying to change one another, to accept each other as is, and then we'll be able to change ourselves. That's very important for the coexistence of people in friendships, in marriages, and between nations and cultures as well. To appreciate one another with our differences gives others the opportunity to change freely and not under duress. Luther himself did not always live according to these maxims. If you just take a look at how he wrote about Jews, Turks and Catholics, you'd think, Lord have mercy. But he will have to answer to the Lord for that. When Martin Luther set out on his last visit to his hometown Eisleben, he was already seriously ill. He had been sent to mediate in a quarrel between two Mansfeld counts. His mission was successful, and he also had the strength to preach one last sermon there in St. Andrew's Church. By the evening of February 17, 1546, Luther's strength was fading rapidly. Oh, dear Jonas, I think that I will remain in Eisleben, where I was born and baptized, he said. Jonas was his friend and colleague from university. In the early morning hours of February 18th, Luther felt the chill of death coming on him. Jonas asked him, Honorable Father, do you die steadfast in Christ and in the doctrine that you preached? He answered with a loud, clear, yeah. It was Martin Luther's last word. He passed on quietly and peacefully. The Stunde des Todes is for the the details of Luther's last moments were very important for the impact he had. For his contemporaries, and by the way, for those in later centuries, the moment of death was crucial in evaluating his entire life's work. That's why very exact reports and first-hand versions exist detailing his death. And it was very important for them to point out that Luther died peacefully giving his trust to God and with a certain good cheer. On the way to Eisleben, Luther had preached one last time in the market church in Halle, now, as his corpse was being carried back to Wittenberg, he was briefly laid in the church's sacristy. There, a death mask was made. It can still be seen in Halle and is reported never to have left the city. Casts were made of his hands as well. Ich habe als Student in Halle um, das Privileg As a student in Halle, I had the privilege of being shown the famous Halle death mask by the vicar at the time. Eyes had been set into it. It was 1963, and he let me photograph it and look at it up close. And he told me the story about how they set the eyes into it later on and put a beretta on top and bent the hands so it looked like he was holding a plume and mounted the whole thing over the pulpit. All this directly contradicts the Bible and even Luther, who never wanted his followers to call themselves by his name. I ask that people not call themselves Lutheran, but rather Christians. How should I, a poor stinking bag of worms, I, a stout doctor, become so that the children of Christ are named with my unholy name? He meant that seriously. He'd always resisted the superbia, the hubris in himself. He was a modest man, but at the same time he was something of a know-it-all, which he'd most likely inherited from his father, but was still very much to blame for it himself. At any rate, these alterations to his death mask only show the way of all earthly glory, 
It's all absurd. Now he's with his Lord Jesus Christ and in his grace. That's what he always wanted. Just as the circle of Martin Luther's earthly existence closed with his birth and death in Eisleben, his academic and religious career ended where it had begun, in Wittenberg. He was laid to rest in the All Saints Church, under the pulpit, to Luther the most important part of the building. His friend, Johannes Bugenhagen, gave the funeral oration in German and Melanchthon in Latin. Buchenhagen spoke of him as a great teacher, prophet, and divinely sent reformer of the church, and ended with Luther's epitaph to himself. Pope, Pope, when I lived I was your pestilence, when I die I will be your bitter death. Within a year the imperial troops were in Wittenberg, and Luther's greatest adversary, Charles V, stood at his grave. Man hat in einer Nacht, 1892, das Grab geöffnet. One night in 1892, they opened the grave and they found the corpse. So Charles V only stood at Luther's grave, but did not have it opened. And above all, he did not have it destroyed. But that night in 1892, they were so excited that they closed the grave again in a great hurry. And in the excitement, the sexton forgot to put a handle from Luther's coffin back into the tomb. And so it was eventually put on display in the Luther House in Wittenberg. It's a kind of visible proof that the incident never took place the way it's so often presented in the literature. Luther rests in the All Saints Church. Charles V did not open the grave and did not destroy it. Duke Alba is said to have told Charles, Here lies the heretic, burn him. Charles V answered, I don't wage war against the dead. Karl V. soll dann gesagt haben, ich führe keinen Krieg gegen Tote. Shortly afterward, Charles V. retired from the secular and political world and spent his last two years in a monastery near Madrid, Spain. He had lost the battle against the mendicant monk, the beggar who wielded the pen against the sword. Ich finde, das was uh, was Luther meint. I found Luther's message wonderfully expressed in a quote by Bertolt Brecht, of all people. He wrote, what is good, to let no one come to harm, not even oneself, to fill everyone with happiness, even oneself, that is good. That is to say, there is no reason why a person cannot be good to himself, no reason to be always flagellating oneself, it also means enjoy this wonderful life with gratitude, wondering over it, thanking God for all the senses we use to experience life. Luther found wonderful images to express that. What's most important to me today from a theological standpoint, especially in our society, is the justification by faith alone. But we have to put it into practice. No 17-year-old in Germany asks, how do I find a merciful God? But quite a few people in Germany, and especially young people, are haunted by the question, does my life have any meaning? I think the suicide rate in our country is alarmingly high. And someone who is out of work, or a girl who doesn't measure up to the norm in our country, slim and beautiful, I want to be able to say to that person, yes, your life has meaning. God gives you your life as a gift. God has got something in mind for you. And in God's eyes, you are good and beautiful just the way you are. Now take your life in your hands and do something with it. God as a solid rock I can hold on to when the storms of life rage. I think that's a wonderful insight on Luther's part. I don't even have to look all that great. I don't have to be a really great achiever or get the best job, have a nice car and lots of money. Rather, it is me that is of value. Luther's theology is not a philosophical theology. He doesn't speculate on the nature of things. He deals with existential questions. And that is what fascinates me about Luther, that he actually managed to bring theology back down to earth, that with him it's about people, that he asked questions about life. And it fascinates me that one man asked, what about the human being, against all the philosophy and all the theology of his environment and his times? By that, you can see how human and how contemporary Luther was. 
die ein Zeitgenosse Luther ist. While Wittenberg is called the mother of the Reformation, Torgau is known as its nursemaid. Frederick the Wise and his successors expanded both the city and its castle, making it one of the principal residences of the Saxon electors. It became the intellectual and political center of the Reformation, producing such key documents as the Torgauer Articles, an important forerunner of the Augsburg Confession. The first Protestant church was consecrated here by Luther himself in Hartenfels Castle in 1544. In my opinion, we Germans are not self-confident enough about our accomplishments. There is far more to Germany than just the Third Reich. I think that our history highlights the importance of two things. In particular, one is responsibility and the other is that self-confidence. We could draw on this history and the wealth of stories and the accomplishments we have to build the self-confidence of the individual and at the same time appeal to and encourage civil responsibility. Or we could at least come out with a few of the true stories showing that people of character really can change things. And if we don't, I don't know who else will. Torgau was also the place where Katharina von Bora's journey came to an end, Luther's Lord Katie. War had laid waste to her house and her farm and left her in poverty. In 1552, she and her surviving children fled an outbreak of the plague in Wittenberg. At the gates of Torgau, their wagon tipped over, and Katharina was so badly hurt that she was unable to get back on her feet. On the 20th of December, after a long and hard struggle, she went on to join her Martin, six years after his death.